Hello and welcome to the COPE webinar on current issues and peer review. This is Heather Tierney, Managing Editor at the American Chemical Society and a COPE Council member. I'm pleased to be your moderator today. We have three great talks planned for you and we'll save some time at the end for Q&A with our speakers. Now I am pleased to introduce our first speaker. I will turn it over to Tony Ross Hellauer who's the Scientific Manager of the Open Air Project at the University of Göttingen. Tony is going to be talking to us about opening peer review. Over to you, Tony. Yes, thank you. And as we said, I'm Scientific Manager for Open Air. Open Air is an initiative funded by the European Commission to um, implement and monitor open access and open science policies in Europe. And as part of that work in the, in the current project, um, I was overseeing uh, a task on open peer review and I, I'll, I'll describe some of that work today. So the first question is why open peer review? And we know, um, I'm sure, that although peer review, most people um, appreciate peer review, they think that it improves paper uh, articles and so on, uh, but that there are problems with it. And here I've just listed in, in broad terms a few of the problems. So um, one common complaint is the amount of time that it takes between submission and appearance in a journal. So time. Another problem is uh, of accountability. So with uh, the blinding system, there's problems of, of biases within um, review. So social biases as well as publication biases. Um, there are problems of incentives. Why? Why should researchers review? They have so many other things to do. Um, and then there's the problem of, of uh, what I call here wasted effort, which is that once those reviews have done their job and they've been used to um, either appraise or improve uh, manuscripts that they're not really ever seen again, but there's still a lot of good information in those that um, perhaps serves as good contextual information to the um, to, to the works uh, that they were reviewing. So uh, so there are problems with peer review and, and at the same time, there is the rising agenda of open science. So what is open science? So open science is a, a bunch of things. It's things like open access to publications, open access to data, open methods, uh, citizen science. Um, but really all of those things are, are about trying to build, bring uh, some of these concepts uh, to to scholarship, so more um, accessibility of output, also accessibility for people, uh, more transparency, um, more uh, responsibility and rigor um, within the process within uh, processes of scholarship, more levels of collaboration and community involvement, more inclusivity, including for those outside academia, uh, the reusability. Um, of uh, of scholarly outputs, the reproducibility ultimately, um, and uh, the making interoperable of uh, of uh, systems and research. So this open science agenda meets with uh, with peer review in what's come to be called um, open peer review, and so this was um, our starting point within open air was what is open peer review? Is it a good idea? Um, in what ways could it be used to improve the system of scholarship? So the first question is, what is open peer review? And, um, and this turns out not to be an easy question to answer. The word open has a lot of meanings. And originally, I think open was just um, uh, because we still use this, bli this metaphor of blindness, which is uh, unfortunate. But um, I presume that uh, open peer review was originally meant to mean eyes open. So open peer review has been used in the literature for about 35 years, I think. Up until the 2000s or so, mostly it has been used to refer to peer review where um, there is no anonymity, so where the reviewers are known to the author. There are a lot of other ways in which peer review can be opened. I mean, open is a, um, a very f flexible concept, um, which is probably why it's used so much at the moment. So uh, you can also open the reports, for instance, um, by uh, publishing them alongside the article or uh, either after publication or um, right from the start. You can open the participation. So rather than having editors inviting reviewers, uh, you can quote unquote 
crowdsource the reviews and just open it up to uh, to everybody who wants to um, uh, to add input. And then there are a lot of other ways in which uh, you can open uh, the review process. You can open interaction, for example, um, rather than having reviewers and authors corresponding only with the editor as the go-between, you can invite the reviewers to discuss amongst themselves and come to consensus. You can invite the reviewers to discuss directly with authors um, to come to consensus. Um, uh, you can open the manuscripts right from the start of the process. So, for example, at, at F1000, where the manuscripts undergo um, a basic check to make sure that they meet cert uh, certain basic standards, but then go online in advance of any peer review. You can you can open a commenting platform for anybody who wants to comment on the research. And then finally, um, a very um, fringe aspect is that you can open up the platform so the so you can have decoupled peer review. I went through 122, I found 122 definitions in the literature and I analyzed them against these seven traits and it turned out that there were 22 distinct configurations of those traits within the literature. Um, and so I, uh, in the, the paper which is uh, cited here, um, I suggest that we need to be aware of this ambiguity, it's okay, um, but we need to be clear about what kinds of open peer review we're talking about when we when we talk, because sometimes I think we can tend to talk past each other. The problems um, uh, that open identities aim to solve are very different from the problems that open um, reports aim to, or often are quite different from the problems that open reports aim to solve. And so, yeah, together all of these different trades make up a toolbox for journals to experiment, to decide based on what their uh, community is telling them would be the best system for them. Moving on then, so this was one strand of research to define and, and, and a second strand was um, to test attitudes to uh, open peer review. So in this regard, we um, in the um, autumn of 2016, we uh, issued an online um, survey uh, it was an open survey, so it was uh, just by uh, by invitation to everybody. It was very well um, answered. We had uh, more than 3,000 uh, total responses. Um, we think that the results, because of the method of distribution, uh, the results maybe skew more towards people who are in favour of open scholarship. The results show that um, show that um, open peer review is already mainstream. Uh, more than three quarters had practical experience either as editor, author, or reviewer of some form of open peer review. And I suppose when we take into account all the different phenomena that are grouped under this term, that maybe shouldn't be surprising. But just considering open peer review as a, a brood concept, so the, the broad concept of open peer review, most people are, are in favor and believe that it should be a co common practice within scholarly communication. And we had uh, positive reactions to most um, of the traits of open peer review. But as with other surveys in, uh, which have uh, asked about open identities peer review, it seems the community are not in favor yet. Um, it, there was there was a little variance amongst discipline, not a great deal, um, and it seems that the plurality are unwilling to accept open identities at the moment. And this is a problem um, because open identities is is in many ways the the ground on which a lot of the supposed benefits of open peer review rest. So, for example, uh, one of the benefits of open peer review is that you can add credit for your reviews. Uh, you can get a DOI and with the an announcement from Crossref that they'll be supporting metadata that we could begin to see uh, reviews become more of a first class uh, research output. But of course, if you're not willing to put your name on it, then you can't cite it on your CV um, in, in more than the broader terms of uh, that you reviewed for a certain journal. Uh, so this was the, the results of the survey. And as I say, um, if uh, you'd like to read more, it's the preprints available on Zenodo. So uh, what are the next steps? So open peer review is a very complex issue. What should be made open? In which circumstances? At what stage? To whom? Uh, there are a lot of a lot of variables there, and a lot of choices to be made. And there, there probably is no one particular right answer. Uh, I think that that will depend on um, on the needs of the the particular community that um, a venue supports, a journal, for instance, for instance supports. Um, and that these views should be taken into account. But we need more evidence to help judge these things. So in the, 
definitions paper which I wrote, I also um, did a review of uh, of the evidence supporting the, the claims for or against the efficacy of, for instance, open identities, peer review, open reports. Uh, and the outcome that uh, the conclusion I came to was that there is often very little ev very little evidence to support or refute many of these claims. And I think that that's something that we really need to fix because if we're in favor of open peer review in terms of um, increasing transparency, in scholarship, then we need to do that based on evidence. And if, if, for example, researchers do not like the idea of open identities, and a lot of them are against the idea of open identities peer review because they, they feel either people won't be honest in their reviews, or if they are honest, that they might face consequences from uh, more senior staff who might hold grudges against them. On that issue, for, in, for instance, to what extent is that actually um, a problem or is that an imagined problem? And uh, by building the evidence, we can take an evidence-based approach. Um, so what I think we need, I'd like to see um, more data sharing and um, ideally open data. So uh, open peer reviews, a lot of them are already online, but we can um, standardize ways in which we can expose uh, this and, and maybe produce a, a, a mass collaborative project to um, work on finding evidence about the efficacy of open peer review. This was it from me. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Tony. Now we'll move into our second talk. Joining us today, we have Jessica Polka, Director of ASAP Bio, as well as Sam Hindle, that ASAP Bio Ambassador, who will be talking to us about peer uh, preprints and peer review. Jessica and Sam, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here to talk about this exciting topic. Sam, this is Jessica. I'm here with Sam. Uh, I'm going to kick off the presentation, then hand it over to Sam midway through. I'm sure that for this audience, um, there's probably a awareness of what preprints are. Um, but just to just to kind of clarify this again, um, preprints are versions of manuscripts that are posted online prior to journal organized peer review or the completion of that journal organized peer review. So they're almost immediately visible to the community, the scientific community, for their feedback, their ideas, and their discussions um, in this permanently citable versioned format. Um, so this really makes research more accessible, accelerates discovery by letting those findings come out during the months, or in some cases, maybe even years, that they would otherwise be spent in uh, the peer review process and that is happening in the traditional publishing. So preprints in the life sciences are growing rapidly. So this is a plot made by Jordan Anaya of prepubmed.org, which is the wonderful search engine. Uh, and as you can see, over the last few months, um, especially, there's been a really rapid growth in the number of preprints posted per month, uh, owing in large part to BioArchive, which is now the largest preprint server in, in the life sciences. So, Feedback on preprints is one of the major benefits. Um, it, I think the over the big picture is preprints, you know, preprints are really helping researchers communicate faster uh, with one another. But there are a lot of, of personal benefits as well. Uh, one of those is the ability to get more um, more comments, more feedback, make the manuscript stronger. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of what we think of when we think of preprinting uh, comments is the comments that appear directly under the preprint at the server. But um, many of the preprint servers, especially um, the, the oldest uh, and kind of most prominent preprint servers, lack commenting features altogether. And uh, even BioArchive, which is, uh, you know, again, sort of this, this largest server in the life sciences, only about 10% of those preprints have comments attached. Rather, there's um, more comments that appear through different channels, so through social media, through PubPeer, through um, annotation layers. The partnership with Hypothesis was just announced uh, a couple of days ago, actually. Um, there are some other sites I'll talk about, um, and also journal clubs, which Sam is really the expert on that. Um, so I just want to highlight that um, probably the preprints that are getting the most attention um, are the ones that are the most contentious. Paper about cell phone radiation and cancer um, that was uh, very much, um, you know, criticized for having small sample sizes. Um, 
and uh, it received a, a lot of comments. This paper is also in the Altmetric Top 100, I believe, for 2016. So it's really been getting a lot of attention, I think, primarily because it's controversial. Um, but, you know, I think an example of, of really uh, constructive feedback, constructive critique, um, can be found on this example, which I'll just share with you now. Uh, this is a, a preprint posted on Sci Archive and shared to a public Facebook group. Um, the author, Daniel, asked for feedback and got a tremendous amount of it. Um, uh, yeah, there we are. So this, whoops, <laughs> let me go back, sorry. Uh, there's a little bit of a delay here. So uh, what you can see is that there's a huge amount of commentary that is appearing on these preprints. Um, and this, you, you won't be able to see it, but there's a, a huge block of, of text here that represents commentary from someone who actually became an author on the preprint after Dan invited him to, uh, to help him revise the manuscript based on this feedback. So this is really a concrete example of preprints kind of helping, feedback on preprints helping to improve the science. Um, there's also specialized websites that are really um, catering toward preprint um, and other you know, post-publication uh, commentary. So for example, Academic Karma uh, is a website where uh, there you can look at peer reviews or uh, basically commentary on, on preprints. Um, peer Community In um, seems to be functioning a little bit more like a F1000 prime model where there's recommendations of either papers or preprints. And of course, there's also other projects like Science Open, Self Journal of Science, et cetera, that are working in, in these areas. And finally, I just want to note before I um, give the microphone to Sam that uh, preprints themselves are a really rapid way of critiquing science. So uh, I, less than 10 days ago, this paper appeared in PNAS by uh, Craig Venter, um, which uh, claims to be able to identify individuals based upon machine learning um, of their genomes. Um, but uh, this figure in the middle here is from the supplement where uh, a lot of the, the criticism this paper has received is that uh, these predictions are basically based upon demographic factors like the ethnicity and gender or the sex, biological sex, excuse me, of the of the uh, the genomes rather than uh, than anything else. Uh, and so there's been a comment posted on BioArchive, a, a critique, a reanalysis, suggesting that those factors alone are capable of de-identifying to the same degree. And uh, I don't think in this slide deck, but really just a couple of years ago, the original authors came back with their own preprint. And I think Sam's going to tell you a little more about the implications of, of this kind of commentary. Yes, yeah, so I think um, another basically benefit of having commenting is that, um, so FASEB, for example, of um, kind of announced that, you know, they're in, um, they're basically agreeing with, well, kind of promoting the idea of um, editors using those comments and taking them into account when um, making decisions. And I think, like personally, from a, a researcher's perspective, I think that's a really like a, a beneficial idea because I have an example myself where, um, you know, the the comments when they get passed on to, um, uh, so, but when you have basically um, the same publisher, you, you submit to one journal and then it gets rejected and then it gets passed on to another journal within that publisher. When those comments are passed on, I think you know that's that can be really beneficial because they can see the whole progression of, of your manuscript. Um, and so I think this is great that if this can be open and um, then you know this can continue regardless of whether you're within a publisher system or not. Um, so I think that's a real benefit. And lastly, um, I just wanted to talk about um, something that I've been involved in and, and a lot of other researchers around the world, um, which is um, the incorporation of preprints into journal clubs. And so this could obviously be um, a preprint journal club itself, where all you do is talk about preprints, or this could simply be um, just the incorporation of preprints into journal clubs that are already um, established. And when you think about it, in a sense, it makes the process a lot more meaningful. Um, because the students can kind of learn about how to critique a paper and it means something because you can then pass that on to authors um, to give them feedback and actually improve their paper. And if this can be um, posted publicly, it also means that it's, it becomes a resource for other students who then want to you know, learn about how to critique a paper too, because it's all in the open. 
Um, and yes, so I think that's one benefit. And Prachi has um, actually put some resources on um, the ASAP Bio website. So you can go there and look at her syllabus for when she um, did a preprint journal club at her institution. Um, and also, um, we're developing, uh, myself and Daniela Sideri, um, we're developing in collaboration with Authoria um, a platform called Pre Review where we're allowing. Um, Basically, journal, uh, hosts of journal clubs can write their reviews at the end and then um, put them onto this platform. And there are others too. So there's uh, academic channels too, where you can post your preprint reviews and make them completely open. And lastly, if you have any more questions, there are resources available uh, on the ASAP Bio website. Um, so thank you. All right. And for our third and final talk, I'm pleased to introduce Elizabeth Moylan, who's senior editor. Research Integrity at Biomed Central and COPE Council member, where she serves as the chair of the COPE Education Subcommittee. Elizabeth will be sharing about the view on peer review from COPE. Elizabeth, over to you. Thanks, Heather. I'm going to give you the brief view on peer review from COPE, how COPE can help. That's lovely. What are the main issues we see in terms of peer review and what transparency? and peer review means um, from COPE's point of view. Here we go. It's a slight delay, but I'm sure you're all aware that COPE um, uh, helps support its members through a number of resources. Um, so many of you, I'm sure, will have heard of the um, COPE guidelines, um, COPE discussion documents, and um, also um, the flowcharts, of course, which are available in, in different languages as well. So these are real um, helpful documents helping our members deal with particular issues. Um, we also support um, our members in other ways as well, um, because it, uh, through the COPE forum. So where um, particular issues occur um, at journals, then our members are free to bring those issues um, to COPE for discussion amongst members who've tuned in on the day, such as those of you who've tuned in today, and also um, with the COPE Council members present. Um, and those cases are really great because um, they're, um, they go into part of the COPE archive. And um, what, what's so lovely about that is there's an online COPE cases database and um, the all, all the information of the particular case is entered in anonymized format um, and coded um, according to the recent um, COPE classification of 2013 um, by Irene Hames and people. And um, it means that anybody is free to look up a particular issue. So if you've got an authorship issue at your journal, you can look up the cases and see whether they can help you. So that cases um, resource is, is, is a great resource for people. So um, and the other thing, of course, so it, we've got the resources, we've got the support. Um, the other thing that COPE does is encourage discussion and debate. So um, I gave you a little bit of background about the COPE cases, and it was great to hear Tony talk about what's the evidence for peer review. Um, and the evidence um, for the issues we see at peer review um, is shown here on the screen from COPE. So this is a small data set, admittedly, but these are all the peer review cases that have been brought to COPE um, over the years since 1990 when COPE was founded to 2016, so it's 43 cases. And if you take a deeper dive into those cases and see what the particular issue was in peer review, you can see that many of the issues um, were due to breaches in confidentiality. Um, then there were some issues in the peer review editorial process and handling, um, such as how do, you hand, how do you handle a particular um, response to an article and how do you peer review that? How do you peer review similar manuscripts? Those sorts of considerations. And another issue was conflicts of interest. Um, so they're, they're the main issues that we see at COPE. It's worth highlighting the very small um, segment there in the pie chart um, with the number three. They're the cases of um, compromise peer review we see brought to COPE, which are very few, but actually very recent. So you can, you can get a handle on sort of how the peer review issues have changed over the year as well. Um, and this research was um, presented as a poster at the Peer Review Congress earlier um, this week. And I've just given a small bitly link there if you want to know a bit more about it. And so um, bearing in mind um, that those are the sorts of issues we see, um, the Education Subcommittee have been working on um, how we can improve uh, uh, 
and give new COPE guidance for new for new issues that are coming up. So this is an infographic on what to consider when asked to peer review a manuscript and we thought that if you're very transparent at that stage then hopefully that heads, up, heads off some of the problems that can occur later. So is it a journal you know? Is it a model of peer review you're comfortable with? Um, have you got any conflicts of interest? And um, if you have, it might not be a particular problem, you know, we, we'd encourage you to discuss that with the editor. And finally, um, do you have the necessary expertise um, and time to do the peer review? And uh, in recognising the um, potential uh, manipulation of the peer review process is, is a sort of growing uh, topical issue at the moment. Um, this is some work that came out of the seminar that was discussed um, last year in Philadelphia when there was a seminar on ethics in peer review and there were a number of presentations given there and a number of tips and um, tricks shared by the presenters and that's um, clustered here in an infographic which, which went live I think just today so you can find that. Um, on the COPE website. And um, we've also got two um, uh, documents that we've revised, the COPE Ethical Guidelines for Peer Reviewers, um, which was originally um, published in 2013 and has been very popular, and the COPE Discussion Document, Who Owns Peer Reviews, which is more recent. But both these documents speak to um, issues we see in the in the cases brought to COPE, particularly um, issues with regard to confidentiality and ownership and conflicts of interest that can come up during the peer review process. Um, both documents have really benefited from guidance given from institutional feedback as part of the new pilot that COPE's um, operating um, in collaboration with institutions. Um, and although you've seen lots of links and resources, I'd point you to the COPE Digest, which is hot off the press um, this month, and the September issue is full of um, all the peer review resources. So what does transparency in peer review mean? It's funny because if I was answering this question with um, my BMC hat on, I'd probably be quite narrow and say it, 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 it's specifically about the particular model the journal operates. But at COPE, um, we believe it's about a trust and willingness for all parties to operate with transparency and integrity. So for journals, it's about clear policies and guidelines. Um, for all parties involved, editors, reviewers, authors, to declare their conflicts of interest and respect confidentiality, not releasing anything beyond what the journal would want them to release. Um, and um, for reviewers, it's been really transparent about the expertise you have and the time available to do peer review. So I think that takes me to my last slide, Heather, just to say thank you um, to the folks at COPE who make things happen, Natalie, Linda and Sarah, and um, the Education Subcommittee, particularly Sharon, Trevor, Heather and Tara, who've done a lot of work this year. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. All right. And now we're going to open up the discussion for our Q&A. Joining me for the Q&A portion is Allison Taylor from the Optical Society of America and the COPE Council. Allison is going to be reading out questions we've received for discussion with our speakers. Allison, what's our first question today? Thank you, Heather. Yeah, we have a few questions submitted already. I'm going to start with one for Tony. Um, someone was looking for some clarification from you, Tony. Are you saying that a review report that's published along with an article would itself get a DUI and then be listable in someone's CV as a kind of publication itself? Yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, I'm not saying that in the future everybody will list all their publications in their CV necessarily, but they, they would be able to list them if they... Uh, if they were open reports uh, and had a DOI, they would be able to list them, for example, in uh, promotion and tenure um, uh, activities. So, yes, it, I mean, it already is the case that um, the peer review reports, for example, from F1000, have a DOI, it's, it's uh, a sub-DOI. But in fact, two days ago, Crossref, which um, uh, uh, which uh, oversees the um, is is one of the registrars of of DOIs um, announced that they would be creating a, a new metadata schema specifically for peer reviews. Uh, so being able to say what kind of peer review, when accepted, when revisions have happened, and so on. Um, and 
this being able to make the the, the peer review activity um, visible is one of the key uh, potential drivers of incentive uh, within peer review because of, of course um, maybe you would be incentivized to do a, a um, the best job possible if you know that your report will be online and potentially even with your name attached for um, in perpetuity but also the fact that um, you would be able to um, to, to uh, demonstrate for example in promotion and tenure activities um, your specific um, uh, peer reviews and also I mean this is already the case for example with pub, with uh, Publons there you can list your peer review activities um, I think they can already be um, integrated into your ORCID account and so on I hope that answers the question thank you Tony this next question is probably another one that you can answer Tony but I think there are elements of it that Jessica and Sam can probably address too. The questioner mentions that the current plurality in peer review models poses quite a challenge for new reviewers uh, just being able to understand what each model requires of them as reviewers and getting to grips with different forms of open peer review. Um, so I wonder if you could comment on that a little bit Tony and then maybe Jessica and Sam can comment on that too with with from the preprint side and what might be uh, kind of new and different and confusing for new reviewers there. Yeah, um, absolutely. So uh, just to comment briefly, so, but yes, absolutely. There, there are a lot of different models and, but I think they should be so because I, I think that different communities, um, even within disciplines will, um, will have their own, uh, their own views on, on, on the best procedure. I think what's most important is the transparency aspect to come back to that um, to that theme, which is that the, uh, the journals are very clear um, in, uh, in giving um, instructions to authors of the terms on which they are agreeing to, um, to peer review at the point at which they agree. Um, and also, I mean, there are um, initiatives underway at the moment um, for help with training in, in peer review, for example, um, again from, from Publons, but um, also from, from many journals to, um, yeah, to give uh, uh, some formal training in this area, which is very often uh, just picked up um, by a, a see and do, um, uh, uh, in a, a kind of a, a, a see and do manner um, in, uh, in by researchers. Yeah, I think in terms of for preprints, um, that is kind of a potential issue is for early career research in, in both a, a positive and a negative way, um, in that obviously the positives are that they, um, by writing comments and doing peer review, um, they can hopefully get credit, you know, it, um, particularly with our platform, and I'm not sure with Crossref, um, we would add a DOI, so again, they, just like with um, a standard peer review, um, you would be able to then cite that in your CV or, or on um, job applications and things. Um, so there's the obvious kind of training uh, benefits as well. So if you're doing them as, as preprint journal clubs, for example, um, then you, you would be able to kind of get a lot of training during that in terms of how to actually do peer review. So when you hopefully then do become a principal investigator, you would already have that training. But the downside for the, the open commenting side of things um, is if you don't have, um, um, if you don't make it anonymous um, in terms of the identity of the author, um, then that can obviously potentially be a little bit scary for early career researchers because they maybe we don't have confidence in their review abilities um, or that potentially there could be pushback um, and, and implications later in their career if they happen to comment on um, a more senior um, members um, preprint, for example, um, and then this kind of having implications later for their career. And um, so I think it is a very important um, issue and, and maybe for some early career researchers, there's obviously the option of, of just um, emailing your comments to the authors and that way you can, you can it's a little bit more protected, um, but I think it is an important issue and I think at this stage, we need to have multiple options basically available. Um, and if you want to remain anonymous um, as another career researcher, maybe that should be an option. Um, yeah, but I, myself, I'm very open. So um, I would like to promote 
everything being completely open, but I understand that there are issues involved for early career researchers. I hope that answered the question. Thank you. Here's a question that brings together preprints and ethics issues. Um, so maybe this is one that Sam, you and Elizabeth could tag team on. What should happen to preprints if peer review then uncovers some sort of unfixable flaw or major ethical problem in the paper? Um, I could start if you like. Um, I think again, this is this is a, a, a bit of a um, a problem, um, and I guess I mean, for me, I would personally see that there should, if the the preprint maybe should remain, but there should be a, some way of um, of flagging the the preprint. I think um, because obviously, if there's, um, I mean, it depends on the the ethical standards and 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 then the the um, kind of how how the ethics of uh, what the ethical issue is. Um, I think in some cases it should be removed, um, but maybe there's a way of flagging the, the preprint itself. Um, Maybe Elizabeth has more comments on that. I think that's really tricky. Um, <laughs> it comes down to um, ownership issues and confidentiality, doesn't it? So I guess if someone's posted a preprint, then they're happy to be transparent about that. Um, so I probably wouldn't advise just taking it down. Um, um, but if there is some way of um, transparently referring to what the particular issue is, maybe there was no ethical approval or something like that, it's, it's important for people to know. Um, so yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I think I want some mechanism um, for, for flagging on the preprint itself what the particular concern was. Um, in, in, in neutral terminology, but, but, but uh, flagging the issue. It'd be good to hear if other people, what other people think. <laughs> I don't know if Tony's got a view on that. <laughs> no. Okay. With you. <laughs> yeah. There's a, a quick follow up question on that about flagging um, preprints. Who'd be responsible for flagging it transparently? especially if the manuscript is under review at a peer-reviewed journal? Um, I think, I think um, if somebody has come across a, a, um, a situation, well, they, they won't necessarily know if, uh, if, if it's under review at the journal, would they? Um, I think if it's under peer review, review at the journal and you've got an issue, then I would probably stop peer review at the journal and, and talk to the authors. Yeah, I, I agree with that entirely. Okay, thank you. Is there any evidence that open peer review has an impact on reducing bias? Or in the absence of available evidence, is there any a priori reason to suspect that open peer review would reduce bias? I think, Tony, that probably could go back to you to begin with. Yeah, so um, there's the, the list of problems that I presented at the start um, and the list of different types of open peer review, um, a, lot, a, a lot of different types of open peer review are, are aiming at, at different problems there. The, the problem of bias um, is the potential bias of a... Um, of a reviewer um, uh, who is not known, um, passing judgment um, and being able to play out their potential biases without their um, uh, identity being known. So, um, as one um, on the uh, as one of my reviewers actually pointed out on my paper on uh, uh, when I was making revisions to my paper one of the things about open identities is that it makes it more apparent if your potential reviewers have conflicts of interest which haven't been flagged by the editors and that makes those um, uh, more um, visible to, to readers as well um, also there is a well it's it's theorized that if people um, know that they're acting in the open they might um, think about their biases more or, or check um, but as I say there is very there's not really very much um, evidence 
um, I'm not aware of any particular studies of the effect of um, non-blind peer review um, on biases. But uh, again, this is just um, grist to the mill for the call for, for more research. Thank you, Tony. I have one last question, I think, that should finish us off. Um, and all of you could chime in a little bit on this one, I think. Who should be responsible for gathering the data necessary to know in which direction open science, um, whether that's open reviews, um, having reviewers identified transparent review, which direction that should proceed based on what reviewers need and want? I think there's a lot of peer review research going on um, in various uh, communities, um, even uh, various journals um, and researchers as well. So I don't think it falls to one particular body to do that, but I, I agree with Tony that we have to share the data for it uh, and see what the evidence would point to. Tony, can you add anything to that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I think everybody has a, well, the, all the communities are invested in uh, the um, uh, in the dissemination of scientific results. Of, scholar, of scholarship should um, have an investment in that question. But obviously, um, so uh, researchers, um, I, th I think that the publishers do have an, an obligation, especially because um, I've been told that um, based on the profit margins that they have quite a lot of money, which they could maybe invest in uh, in this area. Um, yeah, in, I yeah. think in general, it's up to, sorry, I think in general it's up to everybody and, and what I propose in that blog post is that if we put the, if we put all the data out there, because mm -hmm. quite a lot of these studies are done on, on, on your own journals, mm -hmm. on your, because that's where you have the data, but if we get the data out there and a lot of it already is open, then everybody could do it and um, we just published a, a mass collaboration paper with the, uh, uh, 33 researchers from over the world on peer review and this was just a collaborative effort so if the data is there then and, and really in the age of open science then we could have just anybody who was interested in examining these questions would be able to yeah. um, answer, answer them. Yeah I, I think we're in agreement and we're just not forcing one particular community to 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 do, to do it all. I agree with you that publishers absolutely have a role to play, but um, sharing the data may, may be even more powerful. And um, Peery is an, an initiative which is uh, sharing data on peer review between publishers to address these kind of questions. So I thought I'd just mention them. And the only thing I can really add, sorry, quickly from a preprint perspective and really just from um, my own personal plans and things um, is as part of this um, preprint journal club um, project that I'm working on with Daniel Sideri and um, where our plan is like the beta stage of this project is to basically we, we've managed to get some funding to get um, 20 beta testers who are going to test out our resources that we've developed for um, preprint journal club and and for early career researchers to um, construct their reviews um, but as part of this project, we're going to basically put out surveys that they would ask the uh, attendees of the um, journal clubs, like whether it was a useful practice um, and their opinions on being involved in the process and about open peer review. Um, and also to send um, surveys to the authors who will receive feedback from um, these uh, preprint journal clubs as to whether it was useful, just as a way of um, dating co uh, for data collection. And so we will basically, we're asking each beta tester to do two um, preprint journal clubs. So that means that we will get back 40. I mean, it's only an N of 40, but it's a start. Um, and so we were hoping to expand that after the beta testing stage and try and get some data from that. Great. And with that, I think we'll wrap up the Q&A. Thanks to Alison and thanks to all of our uh, speakers for the discussion today. We're, we apologize to those whose questions we didn't answer, but thank you to everyone for submitting your questions today. With that, I'd just like to say thank you to all of our speakers and all of our audience uh, who joined us today. If you'd like to refer back to the webinar later, the recording will be posted online later this month. Thanks again for joining us. <laughs>